Welcome to King of Cats. Now, before we start, I'm going to ask you a question. Have you ever had to make a decision and you're like, I shouldn't do that, but I really want to because I want to see how it plays out, but it would be really bad for humanity? Yeah, well, that's what this game lets you do. It's an interactive visual novel where you can make choices that can get people killed or save their lives. And in today's video, we're going to get as many people killed as possible. In fact, there's actually an achievement for getting as many people killed as possible. Also, the first two thirds to nine tenths of this video will just be me playing the game. If you want to get to the part where I just get people killed, the timestamp is in the description. All right, let's start this. Santa Barbara, California, 1992. The rain patters lightly on the nylon cover hanging over the patio. The, the man stands next to his stool at a high table draped in gaudy checkered cloth. Gaudy? Gaudy? He opens a second beer and stirs, stirs a bowl of clam chowder without particular interest. Val Fortunato thought that this might be the worst chowder he's tasted in his life. He drops the spoon into the soup and glances around the restaurant. This place is practically empty. Just a quaint little house on an ugly property that consists mostly of mud and cement. Hey, don't judge. Humble beginnings. A row of California palm trees lines one side of the lot, marking the border between the next property over. Val leans against the table and sips his beer and waits. 30 minutes and another beer and a half pass before the contact finally arrives. Ooh, the contact. We sell drugs? The man parks his car and hurries through the lot, shielding himself from the rain as he trots along. Finally. I feel like I've been waiting all day long. Sorry about that. I had to make a few quick calls. He's a slender man dressed in khakis and a collared shirt with a zoo logo. It looks like a uniform. The seller brushes the rain off his clothes and sits at the stool directly across from Val. Oh, not a problem. You want some dinner? Something to drink? Sure. Sure. Why not? I drove two and a half hours to come here. I could use a bite and a beer. I, I already forgot if those voices were the same or not <laughs> for the seller. They call over the waiter and he takes their orders. The man orders two beers and asks for a rare steak and a side of baked potatoes. And you, sir? How was the chowder? I know, I know we're in California, but still. It's the worst. <clears throat> it's the worst thing I've ever tasted in my life. Literally just crappiest. I could get my own crap on my toilet and it would be better. Probably. With some spice, you can make it good. The waiter is taken aback by how plainly Val tells him this. I want something else. Let me get... The same thing, steak and a side of baked potatoes, chicken sandwich of honey mustard, some bread and butter. Um, uh, you know what? Chicken sandwich. That sounds good. Get the protein. Val orders a chicken sandwich with honey mustard and the way after the waiter leaves, the two men sit in silence for a moment. So... I heard you're in the market for cats. That's right. <clears throat> That's right. And I also hear any old zoo cat won't do. It has to be a special cat. You heard right. The man folds his hands on the table and smiles. <laughs> I have something that will make your partners very happy. These cats are really something else. I got them out of the San Diego Zoo just in time. Another few hours and we wouldn't even be having this conversation. <sighs> that bad. Yeah, two whole litters of them. Even the damn cubs. Naturally, if you take them all, I'll cut you a nice discount. Naturally. So, what do you say? You want the whole lot? The waiter arrives again with their food and drinks. He lays out the steak, potatoes, and two beers in front of the cellar, then, put down, then puts down Val's sandwich. You gentlemen, enjoy. The man, sta the man stays silent until the waiter walks out of earshot. So, how's that sandwich? It's actually not that bad. It's, it's like the clam chowder I got was the worst thing they had. But I'm, I'm <clears throat> sorry, you didn't hear that. That doesn't fit up my character. I could come back here for another if I found myself in the neighborhood, which I never will because I don't do, I only do shady deals in neighborhoods like this. Val pulls a checkbook out of his pocket and lays it on the table. Let's discuss these cats. You got a pen? When Val arrives back at his hotel room, he goes straight to the phone to call his longtime friend and business partner, David Kemp, doctor of wildlife biology. Ooh. The man on the phone speaks of a gruff and short tone. Hello? David, it's me. <laughs> I know it's not a very short or gruff tone, but still, I thought it'd be funnier if it was the opposite. I met the seller. The deal seems legit. The man on the phone breathes a sigh of relief. Huh. Excellent. How many cats did you buy? About a dozen. Most of the cubs. From what I understand, the adults teach their cubs, so they were just going to put the whole litter down. Jesus, even the cubs? These people are the real wild animals. 
What a novel sentiment. Somebody should make a movie about that idea. Hey, I'm serious. How can you deliver yourself after murdering a baby animal? You just can't. It's sickos. No. All right, Dave. I got you. I'm just busting your balls. Not sucking. Not into that. <sighs> I know. Are you making the arrangements of our longshoremen? Yeah, I'm on it, Dave. Is everything lined up in Tijuana? T Tijuana? Naturally. One of my former colleagues pointed me to a gentleman by the name of... Well, I don't remember. Something Spanish in any case. He wants as many cats as he can get. Excellent. I'll call you when we're about to leave port. No, call me as soon as you set things up. I want to come along. I need to see my creations. My pets. My experiments. I don't know what's going to happen. I'm just uh, speculating on the ship. Y you've got to be me. That's going to look suspicious as hell. I don't care. Make it happen. That's what I pay you for. This is a major investment and I want to see it through. I'm also bringing along a friend. His name is Lindsay. I think you'll get along with him. He's a no-nonsense kind of guy. <sighs> if you say so, Dave. I'm also bringing Joey along. What the hell for? If we get in any trouble with any local authorities, he'll come in real handy. He's got connections in California. He'll use them to put out any fires, so to speak. All right. I'll call you as soon as we have a shipping date. Good. I'll see you then. The man on the other line hangs up with the phone. Beep! Val sits in the silent hotel and stares out the window. The rain is coming down now harder than before. He doesn't like the idea of David coming along for the ride, let alone two of his lackeys. But as a two-thirds shareholder and bigger money spender, David is technically the boss. Ooh. Val has no power but to make suggestions. We're all gonna die. He picks up the phone and calls the longshoreman to arrange transport for his newly bought cats. Ah. Cats. Doctors. Person of Connections. October 18th, 1992, on board the cargo ship USS Black Grove. Did they say it a month earlier? Ah, I wasn't paying attention. The cargo ship left port four hours ago. The sun is sitting, setting in the red evening sky. The Black Grove is driving to south toward Tijuana, Mexico. Val enters the commons and scans the room. He spots two men he recognizes, plus some members of the ship's crew. <clears throat> Ray Lindsay is the muscle man that Dr. Kemp hired. Bald with a black mustache. He's a fit man of a pair of khaki shorts and sandals contrasting his leather jacket. A leather jacket of khaki shorts and sandals? That That is an interesting choice. But okay, that's fine. Lindsay's outfit is like an international mercenary turned age. And that's exactly what I was thinking. Age, the aging summer dad part. <laughs> the huge revolver posted on his belt completes the look. Joey Haynes is Dr. Kemp's lawyer. He got dragged along to deal with any problems from California authorities. Now that they've left the states, his work is done and he's just along for the ride. His shirt is unbuttoned and his sleeves rolled up, and his wife beater is sweat soaked. Ugh. The two men are hunched over the counter while they drink shots of scotch from the mini fridge. They turn around and acknowledge Val. Hey Val, want some? We were just playing. And then for Joey, I'ma just do like a... We were just playing a little guessing game. Oh, yeah? Oh, yeah? <laughs> I'm gonna forget all these voices by the time we go through. Oh, yeah. Yeah. What's Dr. Kemp's big secret cargo? I already forgot Joey's. <laughs> you mean the cows? Joey cackles loudly. <laughs> oh, yeah, you're good at jokes, pal. This guy. No, not the cattle. Dr. Kemp obviously didn't bring me and Mr. Haynes along to protect cattle. The ship isn't even outfitted properly for that kind of job, which I would know because I'm an international mercenary who wears khakis and sandals. It's gotta be something stored with cattle. Or maybe inside them. It's just some beef from some big Mexican zoo. Are you sure? I mean, have you seen any cows? Joey, this man is David Kemp's business partner. I'd wager he knows all about the secret cargo and I get off his back, which I'm certain isn't beef. <laughs> Never mind. Is that right? What is it then? Automatic weapons, improvised explosives, and homemade meth. I told you, this guy's a real joker. I'm gonna just go with my voice for Joey. Anyway, there's nothing to worry about. Dave and I have it under control. There's nothing that's gonna happen. Everything's gonna be just a okay, and that's not called foreshadowing. Val gestures to the drunken lawyer. Just keep an eye on this guy and make sure he doesn't fall off the boat. 
The last thing we need is a drowning on our hands. Dang, he just did Joey dirty. Oh, wait, let's save. Save. Boop. In the Black Grove's helm, Captain Frank Walker fiddles with the radio. Heavy rain beats down on the windows as the ship sails southbound. Ship security officer, SSO Genevieve. Genevieve, that's how you say it, I think. Genevieve, Jean, Antonia is at the captain's side listening in on the call. <laughs> oh, there's so many characters. What's going on, Captain? <laughs> Some kind of problem with the cargo. Hold on a second. The audio is distorted and difficult to understand. The voice of sailor Brian Morrison cracks through the speaker. In the cargo hold. Over. Say again. You're breaking up. Over. There's something wrong in the... I don't know what's... Say again. Over. I don't like this, Frank. First we're playing cruise ship with that millionaire and his little posse. Now a problem with the cargo. Oh my gosh. Ugh, voices. What are you talking about? I... I don't know. It's a weird coincidence. You saw, the, you saw the manifest, right? He's just shipping calves for zoo lions. He's probably here to help his staff feed and care for them. Because he's a good person. And I believe in people like that because I'm a little bit naive. Relax, alright? If there's anything wrong with the animals, we need to let him know. I'll call his cabin once we know what's going on. It could just be a loose door or something, okay? <laughs> just chill. Like, I got this. I'm the captain. I am the captain here. A loose door? Maybe some cows got loose. Who knows? I, I don't care. I'm just... I don't get paid enough. Antonia? The speaker continues crackling. Brian's voice comes through clearly for a moment. Send somebody down with some chains and padlocks. Over. The call cuts out. Roger that. Sailor, sending someone down. Over. Sailor Taylor. <laughs> his name was... Okay. <laughs> his, his name rhymes. He was, he was born to be a sailor. Yes, sir. Grab some chains and padlocks from the storage and take them to the cargo hold. And be quick about it. Yes, sir. I like Taylor. He's the best guy so far. Sailor Morrison, and this is Captain Walker. I'm sending Taylor down to help out. Over. Another comes through the speaker, but static. Brian, do you read me? Over. More static. Jean gives him... Jean, Jean, Jean gives him a grave stare. I'm going down there after him. What for? If something's wrong, we'll hear about it any minute now. The safety of the cargo is my responsibility. This, her voice keeps on changing, I'm sorry. Their voice, I, I don't know. I'm going down there. Excuse me, Captain. She storms out of the helm. Okay, she storms out of the helm and hurries after Sailor Morrison. He's joined by second mate Florian Cruz. How many people are there? Oh my gosh. I don't, I'm not going to remember all the voices for them. Hey, Cap. <laughs> hey, Cap. What was that all about? We'll go with it. Okay. Jean's worried about a millionaire's cows. What for? We're locked and loaded with combat shotguns. We don't need to worry about a bunch of illiterate pirates. No, no. It's not pirates she's worried about. Then what? Like, well, well, there's nothing else besides pirates that would ruin it. I don't even imagine her voice to be like this. <laughs> this I'm just ru I'm running out of things I can remember, so, and that's like the most distinct one I can pull out right now. I don't know. I don't know why she's worried. Something about the millionaire and his cows. Excuse me. He holds up the receiver and speaks. Jean, Jean, any updates? Over. In the cargo hold, the distinct sound of a crackling radio echoes through the austere, austere, metal halls. The distorted voice of Captain Walker comes through in a mess of white noise. Brian, do you read me? Over. Sailor Morrison clicks his radio off and latches it to his belt. He scans the hold of a tranquilizer rifle, trembling in his hands. Oh no. The cargo hold is dimly lit. Several light bulbs seem not to work at all. The exit is only a few yards away, but each step he takes thunders through the metal hall. Dung, 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 dung. He steps slowly and dutifully toward the door. Just as he reaches the door, someone on the other side spins the valve and swings it open. There's a man on the other side. Brian levels the tranquilizer rifle at the stranger. Hey, chill out. It's me. Jesus, Eric, you scared me. He lowers the rifle. Come on, let's get out of here and lock up the door. What's going on? There's a bunch of god cats loose. Cats? What the hell are you talking about? Yeah, big orange tigers. Holy Did you tell the captain? Of course I did. Now grab those chains and come on. Oh no, but the ch was blocking it out. No! They exit the cargo hold and push the heavy metal door shut and stand in the downpour. Taylor holds up the chains like they're a pile of slimy worms slick in the rain. Come on, man. 
Don't you know how to seal a door? Give me, give me, give me that. Eric haphazardly dumps the chains into Brian's hands. Brian lifts the heavy chains and heaves them over the valve. The valve twists and the door creaks open and slides ajar under the weight of the chains. Shoot. Push, push that freaking thing shut. The door flings open and smacks into Morrison, sending him stumbling backwards. He points the tranquilizer rifle in the general direction of the door and fires. The dart clangs against the bulkhead. Don't, don't say it hits him. There's something visible in the shadows beyond the open door crackling in the rain. Creaking in the rain. Something growls from inside. Rawr. Oh, shoot. I think we're screwed. Brian racks the bolt of the tranquilizer rifle and fish, fishes around his pockets from under the dirt. Shoot the dang thing, man! Shoot it! Shut up and let me! Tiger lunges out of the shadows and without a sound and moves with impossible speed. It grabs Eric and tackles into the deck in the falling rain. The big cat locks its snarling jaws around his throat and clamps down. His neck breaks so quickly that he doesn't even have time to scream! Ugh. The animal drops his limp body on the wet deck and turns its head back at Brian with dilated eyes. He doubles back to the cargo door, boots squeaking against the slick metal as the tiger's paws patted behind him. Ooh, Brian, you dead, bro. He lunges through the doorway and pulls the short door shut behind him, shuts with such force that it nearly bounces back ajar. But he quickly grabs the valve and pulls it shut before the animal can slip inside. He tries to seal the door, but his slick hands slide off the wet valve. Come on, you bastard. Something growls behind him and his stomach feels like concrete. Oh no, there are more lines. You screwed yourself, bro. He turns around slowly and extends the flap of his coat to make himself look bigger. And he freezes of horror when he sees the rest of the litter in the cargo. Something standing between rows of huge crates. An adult tiger watches him with a pair of cubs at its flanks. Another doesn't beat back. There's another family of tigers, two adults and some cubs. Brian doesn't carry to count them. He drops the coat flap and uses his free hand to produce three darts th from his pocket. The tigers watch him curiously. They seem hesitant to make a move. Brian can hear the big male outside clung at the door. He fixes the rifle at the nearest adult cat. Then he chambers one dart and clamps the other two between his teeth. He mutters through his clenched jaws. Say goodnight, you big bastard. He squeezes the trigger and the sound of compressed air startles the big animal and sends it nearly six feet into the air. The dart whizzes past the adult and hits a tiny cub across the room. Oh, 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 you're so screwed. If you weren't screwed before, Brian, you are. Oh, yeah, you're, you're dead now. The little animal cries out pitifully. <laughs> the animals dart around in collective panic before they calm down and refocus their attention on Brian. In their eyes, he sees a great primordial firestorm bearing down upon him. He lets out his breath slowly. Oh, no. Yeah, he's <clears throat> he's dead. Jean stomps down the stairwell toward the cargo hold. Jean, any captain? Any updates? Over. I'm almost there. Hang on. Over. When she rounds the next corner, she beholds a sight of baffling horror. She sees Morrison stagger through the door and slam it shut behind him. All the while, a large tiger jogs playfully through the rain toward the newly sealed door. The cat regards the closed door of puzzlement, then turns around a toy with its new plaything. Taylor lies on a crumpled pile soaking in the rain. Blood drips down his arms and washes away on the metal floor. Ah! Tyler, you were so young! Taylor, you were so young! A tranquilizer dart protrudes from the animal's shoulder, but it doesn't seem to mind very much. Jean takes careful and quiet steps back into cover and up the stairs. When she reaches the upper deck, she breaks into a sprint and rips the radio from her belt. Mayday, Captain! Mayday! Coming! Over! What's going on, John? There's a gosh dang tiger loose on the ship. A tiger! You know, like like a lion, but striped and orange? It's on a cereal box. Tiger! Over! Oh, what? Got the shotguns, Frank. Out. Whilst the three men sit at the counter and drink, someone sprints past the windows. Val and Lindsay are startled. Joey does not notice. Frickin' Joey, he's too drunk, isn't he? What was that? It looked like a member of the crew. I couldn't tell. What the hell are you guys talking about? Nothing, Joey. Go back to sleep. You, you, you're drunk. You're frickin' useless. Go to sleep. I wasn't sleeping. Then have another drink and let the adults handle the situation. <laughs> oh, dang. <laughs> Lindsay stands up from the stool and marches to the door. Where are you going? Dr. Kemp's cabin. I'm gonna have a word with him. Wait a minute. About what? About the cargo. Gosh, dang it. What's wrong? Nothing, Joey. Don't worry about it. Val hurries out of the commons and follows Lindsay. Joey chuckles to himself. <laughs> Don't mind if I do. And fills up another glass. Guess the old boy can't handle his liquor. 
Jean bursts into the helm and slams the door shut behind her. She frantically spins the valve to secure the door. Frank, Cruz, and Navigator Mike Roger watch in baffled silence. They are armed with three of the four SPAS-12 shotguns kept in the helm. I'm going to call them SPAS-12 shotguns. Jean, what's going on? She rushes through the case and grabs the fourth gun. There's a gosh dang animal on the loose. It killed Taylor. Uh, I, okay, I took a break, so I think I'm already going to forget half the voices, so just bear with me. Oh, my God. <laughs> Killed? What about Morrison? He locked himself inside the cargo hold. I think he's fine. Have we heard from him on the radio? No, I've been calling. Oh, God. Do you think there could be, like, more of them? Horrified sounds hangs over the room. Jean Fillon finishes loading the shotgun and moves straight for the door. Do, the, do ships really have shotguns on them? Huh. I need one of you to come with me. Well, I need to stay here. I've just tuned, turned the ship around and radioed Santa Barbara. I need to answer them after the call. Mike, why don't you go? Wait, what? Hold on. I need to stay here and navigate the ship. Somebody, anybody, come with me. She marches out of the helm, toting her shotgun and leaves the door open in the rain. Frank and Mike stare awkwardly at each other before Cruz speaks. Uh, I'll go. I probably have the second most range time after Jean. Between the two of us, I'm sure we'll be fine. Who accompanies Jean to the cargo hold? Well, you know, my choices do affect if people die or not, so I think I think Frank can come with. No, I'll go. Sorry, Mike. I shouldn't have volunteered you. No worries, Cap. I don't know who Mike is. Uh, we haven't... Are they, are they, no, they're not on here. There's four people talking. Keep yourself safe. Yeah, I'll stay on the radio and give you a call if something, if something comes up. I'll latch the door behind you. The captain nods and hurries out the door. Captain's a wuss. When Lindsay arrives at the cabins, he firmly latches the door behind him. He takes a half he takes half a dozen steps before somebody opens it again. It's Val. He closes and latches the door behind him. Hey, Lindsay, hold on. I wanted a quick word. What is it? He hesitates. I wouldn't bother Dave if I were you. He's uh, a bit irritable about this whole thing. You think I'm worried about him firing me? Lindsay scoffs. <laughs> If you don't want me to upset your friend, why don't you tell me what's in the cargo? Val rubs his brow and sighs heavily. <sighs> Alright, look, I'm sorry for being evasive earlier, but Dave made me swear silence. We're actually shipping, uh, tigers. Man-eating tigers. Excuse me? Yeah, I know. And I was telling the truth about them being tranquilized. I guess I didn't give them enough. I'm assuming there was never an actual veterinarian involved. Dave thought he could figure out the doses on account of his biology degree. Lindsay rolls his eyes and laughs humorly. <laughs> oh, what, a, what a stupid... I don't believe this crap. He storms down the hall to Kemp's cabin and lets loose a storm of knocks. Dr. Kemp! I need to speak with you immediately. He stops knocking and waits. Silence. Lindsay glares at Val, who gives him a blank shrug. I don't know. I guess he left. <laughs> I was saying, I don't know, as in, like, response to him, but the text actually said, I don't know. <laughs> okay. Maybe the captain called him to the helm. Or maybe he went to the commons around the opposite side of the ship. Where do Val and Lindsay go next? To the commons! <sighs> okay. Let's go back to the commons. We need to keep, we need to let Joy know what's going on. We'll just call the helm from there. Okay, let's go. The horizon is dark purple as the light fades to night. John jog jogs to the bottom of the stairs and steps cautiously toward the cargo hold. First mate Cruz speaks on the intercom and her voice thunders in the rainy expanse. Thunders! She warns the crew to lock themselves in the current locations until further notice. Jean rounds the corner and spots the cargo hold door swinging open on its hinges. Oh no! Somebody dropped the chains in the doorway, preventing it from fully closing. There's no blood or any sign of a struggle. Jean steps thoroughly. Yeah. Jean steps slowly through the rain and approaches the swinging door. Heavy footfalls clang on the metal steps behind her. Captain Walker. <laughs> Captain Jean is just boop, 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 and then Captain Walker just dun 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 dun. Jean, where are you? Jean! Dun 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 dun. Are you here? <laughs> Sorry I'm late. Did I miss anything? You're just in time. Come on. I think they're inside. I keep on forgetting her voice. She points at the open door. Follow me and watch my back. Because, like, Val is like, uh, and Jean is like, uh. <laughs> okay, I think I got it. Jean steps closer to the door with the barrel of the shotgun pointed into the dark aperture. 
She reaches the door and pushes it open cautiously. Then she bolts the door open to keep it from swinging shut. Jean enters the dim cargo hold while Captain Walker stands outside and watches her back. She scans the room quickly. It's completely empty. No sign of Morrison or Taylor. No sign of any tigers. Jesus. What's going on? I think I just gave her Val's voice. Whoops. Uh, Jean, we've got a big problem out here. Jean swings around and points her shotgun out the door. At the same moment, the captain frantically blasts at something Jean cannot see. Then, like a flash of orange lightning, a huge cat tackles him to the floor. Oh, he's screwed. Jean opens up on the massive uh, animal. A flash of blood sprays out of its bestial shoulder. It lets out a pitiful cry. <laughs> the tiger drops the captain out of its hot jaws and limps out of Jean's field of view. Jean walks through the door and approaches the captain's crumpled form. Her eyes dart peri paranoiacally in every direction. Oh my god. Frank. The captain's breast has been slashed over his heart by a huge set of claws. His shirt is a bundle of ragged ribbons. There's a set of bleeding holes on his neck where the teeth clamp down on him. Blood streams down his shirt. And how he groans and moves. He's still alive! No! <laughs> I forgot to say this, but I'm going to be trying to get all of them killed. Evidently, the cat did not have time to finish off its prey. But Jean lifts him, over, lifts him over his shoulders and struggles to drag him back to the stairs. She looks around for his fallen shotgun, but it's nowhere to be seen. They must have slid overboard. She clicks her radio. Cruz, get down here. The captain's in bad shape. <clears throat> Cruz, get down here. The captain's in bad shape. Over. Whew. Distant gunshots dissipate into the storm as Lindsay and Val walk to the commons. Sounds like the crew is privy to your little plan. Our plan. We're in this together, remember? Actually, we're not. See, I don't know how much Joey knew, but I was kept completely in the dark. If anything, I'd say you and Dr. Kemp are both guilty of fraud. And this revolver on my khaki shorts proves it. But that's neither here nor there. Come on. When they reach the commons, the door is swinging wildly open and Joey is nowhere to be seen. Ugh, crap, he's gone. And the dumb son of a gun left the door open. Lindsay closes the door to the commons and seals it shut. He probably went to vomit over the railing. I hope he didn't fall overboard. Can't have a lawyer falling overboard, that's just not right. We can't waste our time babysitting an alcoholic moron. Let's get to the helm. When they arrive at the helm, there's a huge commotion going on. <laughs> uh, Jean is still alive, that's, that's wild. The captain's body is spread out on a table. Two officers are tending to his wounds. Blood is dripping on the floor. Val regards the wounded captain with an expression of horror. <gasps> Lindsay, Lindsay grimaces. <gasps> what the hell happened here? Why don't you ask your doctor friend? What? I keep on forgetting her voice. Dr. Kemp is already in the helm. He's embattled in a shouting match with first mate Cruz. You son of a gun, do you realize what you've done? You're responsible for multiple deaths. Would you please calm down and be reasonable? I know I screwed up, but yelling at me won't fix anything. Here are my associates, Val Fortunato and Ray Lindsay. Maybe they can help clear up this whole misunderstanding. Doc Kemp, I came here to have a word with you, but it seems my point's already been made. You acted with complete reckless disregard. Me? You should ask how Val got the cats out in the first place. Everyone is silent. The group turns toward Val. <laughs> uh, I, 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 I only own one third of the company. You should blame him. Points back at Dave. <laughs> Please, Val, enlighten us. Well, uh, earlier this evening, Doctor Kemp sent me down to feed the cats and give them their tranquilizers. And uh, that was just before they got loose. You son of a dumb. Take it easy, okay? I, I don't know what happened. They must have spat out the pills I put in their meat. Oh, he. Oh, that's how he did it? Oh my gosh. Alright, and now I feel vindicated. It's not my fault the animals got loose. You're insane, Dr. Kemp. How dare you talk to me like that? I'm paying you handsomely for. You can keep my paycheck. I want nothing to do with your shady operation. Uh, okay. My money then. We need to stop arguing and figure out what to do. We're uh, secure in here, but we need to check on the rest of the crew. Y you know, because, like, it's the rest of the crew. Namely, Chef. Chef. It's a person's name? <laughs> okay. Namely, Chef and the rest of the sailors. There we go. I got her voice back. Once we get to port, we'll wait for animal control to show up. I, I don't know if animal control is equipped to deal with tigers. 
We checked the commons. Joey's gone missing. Damn that stupid son of a gun. I'll search the ship and see if I can find him. And John is like a a badass. Someone should come with me. Cruz? I'll go. I've got something. I've got to do something to help clean up this mess. Let me have one of those shotguns, though. I feel a bit naked or nothing but my wheel gun. Pats his, pats his side. <laughs> Jean nods. Here, take mine. I need to stay up here and navigate the ship. Am I, am I Mike Kroger? I don't know. Alright, well, I'll stay here and keep an eye on the captain. I'll also get on the radio and let the authorities know we've got a couple scumbags on board. Whoa, hold up. I'm just... I'm just the messenger. I'm literally just the messenger. <laughs> All right, let's go find Joey, Jeff, and the rest of the sailors. Who's Chef? I don't want to do more voices, but I kind of do at the same time. Jean and Lindsay march through the rain by and by. They go downstairs to the lower deck and investigate the dining hall. The lights are off and she can't see anything in the shadows. I fight in the shadows. They call me Batman. Jean enters slowly with a shotgun extended. She flicks the light switch. When the lights come on, she scans the room quickly. No sign of anyone or the tigers. Lindsay follows her in, across the room to the galley door. Jean sweeps the valve and pulls open the door. Chef. Oh, he's literally just the chef. <laughs> okay. Chef is standing on the other side of a baffled expression. His arm has been torn and his white shirt is soaking red, but he managed not to lose his chef's... That's a real chef. Prop. Good, good on you, chef. Jesus, it's you guys. For a second, I was worried that the cots learned how to open doors. Jeff, are you okay? You look, you look hurt. Like, <clears throat> pretty bad. <laughs> Sorry, bad joke. I'm fine. I've stopped the bleeding. Can't really grab anything with his arm, though. You should come with us. We're treating the wounded in the helm. And by wounded, I mean the captain who followed Jean right next to me. <laughs> to his almost death. But hey, that's fine. You can trust us. Alright, that sounds good. Lindsay leads the way back out into the rain, and an orange blur swaps him out of view in the blink of an eye. Holy bugger! Chef sprints into the galley, sits back, sprints back into the galley, and slams the door shut behind him. <laughs> he just calls it on Jean, too. Jean rushes out into the rain to help Lindsay. He's crumpled on the floor as he rests the beast's jaw away from his neck. His cheek is slashed open, and his face is streaked of blood. He screams just as Jean levels the shotgun at his furry assailant. Kind of furry. <laughs> Shoot her! Jean fires twice and both shells explode into the tiger's back. The animal shrieks, ah! And contorts as it jumps off the wounded Lindsay and attempts to scamper away. The spine seems to be severed as it cannot move to its hind legs. He stands up slowly and drains his revolver, draws his revolver, and aims it with deliberation. <laughs> ah, my face used to be beautiful. Lindsay wipes the blood out of his eyes before he squeezes the trigger. Whew. The wounded tiger doesn't make a sound as the bullet passes through the back of its skull. It just falls over limp. Yeah. Lindsay turns around and slowly and regards Jean through his bloodied face and torn clothes before he speaks. I, uh, I could use some medical attention, probably. Chris is on the radio talking to the mainland. Michael Kroger is busy navigating the ship. And Dr. Kemp leans toward Val and whispers, We've got to get out of here before we get to shore. I was thinking the same thing. Lifeboat. Yeah, lifeboat. What about Joey? He could be cat food for all we know. You can't just leave him. We'll see if we can find him along the way. If not, I'm ditching him on the boat, because I got things to do, man. But I'm not going to bend over backwards. This crew is distracted. I'm going to walk to the head and then slip out. You wait 60 seconds and do the same thing. No way. I'm going first. You got me into this whole mess by talking me into this. Hey, come on. Now's not the time. All I was supposed to do is feed the dang cats. This music is really loud. Well, you screwed that up, and now here we are. You son of a bee. I'm in. <laughs> Quiet. Look, whether you believe it or not, I'm on this trolley ride with you. And I don't like where it's heading any more than you do. You must go first, then go. I'll wait a minute and catch up. Okay. I thought he was going to say more. Let's do this, Dave. Standing over the captain's body, Cruz slams her fist and curses. We lost him. <laughs> Time of death is 8.46 p.m. Rest in peace, Frank. 
<laughs> now I'm captain. Woo! Val and Kemp rendezvous in the rain on the upper deck. There you are. Come on. Let's get down to the lifeboats before one of those A people spots us and locks us in the brig. Yeah, or before one of the cats eat us. Very funny. Let's go. Didn't expect Dr. Kemp's to have a beard and be bald. The two men sneak into the, down the stairs and head toward the rear of the ship. Neither man is familiar of cargo ships, but they assume the lifeboats must be on the lower deck. When they find the lifeboat, Joey is already there. <laughs> Let's go, Joey. He's tugging uselessly at the straps on the tarp and doesn't notice their approach. Hey, Joey. Joey jumps and spins around like a startled cat. What? Jeez, I thought you were one of the sailors. What are you doing, Joey? Were you going to take the lifeboat and leave us all? You monster. Joey. Uh, <clears throat> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> he actually said no. No. Don't worry about it. I'm sure there's room for three. Maybe if you can figure this crazy thing out. I've been working on it for 20 minutes. So he's got an air pot right there. You've been standing out here, completely exposed, for 20 minutes? Yeah? So? Joey, you're aware there are tigers loose on the ship, right? Joey laughs and rolls his eyes. Yeah, sure. <laughs> okay, guys. He's serious, Joey. The man-eating tigers we were transporting got loose. Joey's expression settles into solemn seriousness. We were shipping tigers? Oh, I'm just gonna throw this bottle off the board. I'm completely sober now. Tigers? You're kidding me, right? Why were you abandoning the ship if you didn't know about the tigers? When I went looking for you guys, I overheard someone talking in the helm. It sounded like they were writing us out. They said we're going back to California. Yeah, idiot. Because of the tigers. Oh, yeah, that makes more sense. Well, this is all starting to add up. Come on, let's get the hell out of here. The tarp is tied down with a bungee cord. Joey, are you drunk or just a complete booger? Joey says nothing. Val unhooks the bungee cord and carefully pulls it away. All you have to do is push the two hooks together. One plus one equals two hooks pushed together. Just be careful so it doesn't come back and smack you in the face. He's gonna get smacked in the face, isn't he? Val! What? He turns and sees what renders the men speechless. Oh, it's a tiger, isn't it? Yes, a large tiger stands on the deck watching them. It's first soaking in the rain. Uh, skip that. Their eyes are dilated and laser focused on the three men. I see you! Oh, crap. That's not good. Starts running. <laughs> shut up! Just shut up! Shh, shh, shut up! What do we do? I said, shut up. <laughs> the tiger lowers its head and prepares to pounce. Oh, ho, ho. screw this. Joey spins around and breaks into a sprint down the wet deck. <laughs> Joey's the smart one. No wonder why he's a lawyer. <laughs> Joey. Kemp lifts the tarp and jumps into the lifeboat, then yanks it back down over himself. The tiger seems startled by the abrupt chaos, but now it's ready to pounce again. Val decides to... I can hide in the lifeboat with Kemp, I can run with Joey, or I can hang on the railing over the ocean. And again, I'm trying to get all of them killed, so let's hang on the railing over the ocean. We're gonna need some insane grip strength to outlast a tiger, maybe licking our hands or trying to bite our hands, holding onto a metal railing that's wet, and endure a storm. But yeah. Val leaves over the edge of the ship and holds onto the railing with all his strength. He hangs on the side of the boat with his knees knocking against the metal hull. Joey screams in the distance. Uh, Joey's screwed, isn't he? A moment passes as the oceans roar, roars beneath them. The tiger's paws stamp through the pools of water collecting on the deck. Val feels the cat's whiskers brushing his fingers and the fright loosens his grip. Then he feels its breath, the cat smelling his hand. And gently paws his hand and sticks his claws into Val's fingers. Crap! Val kicks his feet in a wild panic and the cat responds by nibbling his hand. It seems to be playing with him. He shrieks and loses his grip. Val drops into the ocean like a falling rock. He flails his arms and tries to paddle, but the undertow sucks him down. As he drags him in water, his screams are muted in the bubbling abyss. But by some miracle, the current yanks him clean past the ship's propellers. He emerges disoriented in a swamp of seafoam left behind by the huge vessel. When he regains his bearings, he begins to appreciate the gravity of the situation. The boat is driving away about him. He reaches his arms out of the water and screams, Help! This is my loud voice, help! His head ducks underwater, and he... Desperately treads back to the surface. When he resurfaces, he screams again. Man overboard! Man overboard! 
Nobody seems to have noted his cries for help. It's a storm. No one's going to hear you, Val. Somewhere in the back of his head, he recalls swimming classes he, he took as a youth. He paddles frantically after the cargo ship. Fifteen minutes pass and he stops swimming. Swimming, His arms and legs burn of exhaustion. Plus, he'd be super cold. Hydr oh, there was a video that came out like a long time ago where you got hit by a sailboat. Like the sail on the sailboat, you got knocked off and you had options. It was like a choose your story or like something. Uh, maybe not. This is a video about how you delve hypothermia and eventually just drowned. Because the ocean is cold. <laughs> he stops to tread water and looks at the ship. It looks like a toy on the horizon. Tiny and plastic. He looks around. There's no coastline or any other ship anywhere in sight. He waves a crushing despair and he keeps swimming. The tiger. Ooh. There's an achievement that says, I shouldn't be alive. Uh oh. The tiger drags Hoey Joey Haynes' fresh corpse and drops it next to the lifeboat. A small warm of swarm of cubs come out from under the stairwell and begins fisting on the dead's flesh. The tiger turns its attention to the strange creature hiding under the tarp. It reaches in and paws gently at the hidden lump. The small creature is trying its best to stay motionless, but the cat detects the faintest, faintest whimper. whimper. The tiger stands up on its hind legs and drops its four legs into the funny lump. Kemp shrieks under the crushing weight. The animal grabs the tarp with its teeth and violently reveals the terrified prey. The man just sits curled up inside the lifeboat while the animal watches him curiously. It paws him as if to check he's actually alive. Kemp can hear the baby animals feasting on the corpse of his companion. While he does his best to stay still, the tiger leans its head inside and bites the collar of his shirt. It lifts him gently out of the lifeboat and drops him on the deck like a newborn babe. The rain falls in heavy sheets against the metal floor. Kemp just sits there, shielding his head and neck from the blow that cannot be deflected. The cubs turn their attention from the fresh kill and look at this cowering animal. The adult tiger steps back and sits down to observe while the cubs excitedly prepare for the first kill. Oh my gosh, this is going to be gruesome. Aww. Aww, what? Boo! <laughs> Chef is napping in the corner of the room with bandages around his arm. Oh, they actually got him out of there. Okay. Lindsay sits on the floor against the wall with bandages on his face. The morphine seems to be setting in just fine. Everyone's wounded. <laughs> John pulls aside commanding officer Cruz for a conversation. This is getting out of control. Tell me something I don't know. Okay, like, I, I know it's out of control. How about this? I'm going to solve this problem myself. What are you talking about? They're cats. Cats like to nest. I'll find their nest and lock it up. Otherwise, I'll shoot every last one of them. Jean is just the bravest character so far. Jesus, you're gonna, just going to get yourself killed. Why, why would you do that? The sailors are in their cabins. The crew is accounted for. Let's just hang back and wait until we get to port. Let animal control do their jobs. Yeah. John pauses for a moment and deliberates her next words. Screw that. I'm going, if you like it or not. The ship's safety is my responsibility. I should have stopped this from happening in the first place. Cruz nods. Understood. I'm going to stay on the radio, though, so good luck. Jean, John, she actually said good luck. <laughs> sure. If you don't mind, I'll be on my way to put down these freaking cats. Jean's voice keeps on changing. I oh, no. can't, can't do this for her. Uh, uh, that's her voice. Let me raspy. Uh. Before Jean goes any further, she stops to come up with a plan. We're to search for the tiger's nest. Um, well, we know where they are currently, but we don't know where the nest is. And I doubt it would be on the upper deck, so let's go lower deck. <clears throat> An uneasy, an uneasy feeling strikes John as she walks through the rain pouring on the lower deck. Because I, I don't think they nest in the cargo hold, would they? That's where they were capt uh, uh, captivated? Uh, kept in captivity? John steps carefully through the rain of her shock and extended. The rain falls around her in heavy sheets. She steps onto the deck and scans her shadowed surroundings. Nothing yet to see. Jean cautiously advances over shotgun, leading the way. It's holding her hand, being like, Okay, John, this way. The rain pours relentlessly as she swings around the corner and sees a cluster of tiger cubs taking cover from the rain under a metal overhang. And among the cats lies the remnants of several mauled human beings. Oh my gosh, I was right? Ugh. Too many skeletons are mutilated in the tiger's nest. Nothing but nod and fatty bones. They must be Sailor Tyler and Sailor Morrison. <laughs> Respect! She recognizes the recently deceased corpse of Dr. Kemp. Yeah, he's dead, huh? His stomach and legs have been thoroughly picked clean by tiny teeth and claws, and finally... The scotch-soaked corpse of Joey Haynes. The tigers had barely touched him. Perhaps they were saving him, saving him for a fine occasion. Letting the whiskey age in his belly. <laughs> uh, does, does it age in your belly if you drink it and then you die? And it does, you don't have, piss it out? Huh. 
Shower thoughts. She stands and beholds the sickening sight. The cubs notice her off the start. She exchanges bewildered expressions with the tiny baby fake tigers. Like, what? And she's like, huh? And the, dad, the adults are like, huh? Oh, crap. What does she do? She spins around and aims her shock and click up target to press space to shoot. Bang! Bang! Jean sees nothing but an impression of blurred fur, eyes, and wet teeth. She fires at the advancing tiger. The big cat falls limp with a pitiful wail. It tries to get back on all fours, but just slumps over. The poor animal drags itself on the floor and mules like a wounded house cat. This one has a tranquilizer dart protruding from its shoulder. It's the animal that killed Taylor Morrison. This is Jean finish off the animal. Again, I'm trying to get them all killed, so no. <laughs> Jean refuses to shoot the beast. She walks away and heads back to the stairwell while the tiger cries out in searing agony. The animal's wails dissolve into the roaring cacophony of the rain. One could say that all the animal wants is a quick death, but she simply denies it that. After dispatching the adult, Jean blocks the nest of crates and returns to the helm. Hours later, the USS Black Grove arrives back in Santa Barbara. When the FBI arrives in Sa Santa Barbara, they vigorous vigorously interrogate everyone who survived the event. None of the survivors are found guilty of any involvement in the operation. A thorough investigation determines Ray Lindsay had been hired under false pretenses. Animal Control collects the last of the tiger litter and schedules them for euthanasia at the local zoo. However, the cubs mysteriously disappear just hours before the scheduled demise. In the end, life returns to normal for the survivors. Posthumously, Dr. David Kemp becomes known by local media outlets as the Kitten King, or the King of Cats. But those who survived the incident aboard the Black Grove just remember him as an a-hole with too much fun. <laughs> Oh wait, shoot, why did I shoot it? I could have just, ah, oh, I could have just let it die. Oh um, I could have just, hold up, I'm going back. How far back can I go? Oh, I can go really far back, okay. Yes, yes! The adult tiger knocks her to the ground before she knows what's happening. The last thing she hears is the huffing grunts of a big cat gnawing on her neck. Everything goes black and Jean falls into a state of overwhelming placidity. Jean, are you there? Come in. Over. Whoops. No reply. Come in, Jean. What's your status? Over. Yes. Dang it. <laughs> all, the, all the characters have that voice in the end. Okay. When the ship lands in California, the event that follows is known as the Santa Barbara Massacre. Animal control agents sweep through the cargo ship room by room before the remaining tigers launch a dizzying ambush. The animals kill one agent and manage to wound three more in the ensuing chaos. The survivors retreat back to the safety of the port. An hour long siege ensues before the local SWAT unit finally storms the ship. Two more operators are killed in the fight against the final remaining tiger. Holy crap! The authorities retrieve the survivors from the helm and the cabins before they begin tallying the dead. Animal control agents take away the surviving cubs to be euthanized. However, too bad, buddy. Is this the bad ending? I think this is the great ending. We got, like, the strongest person killed. So our casualties were SSO Genevieve, Valerio, Joey, Frank. Sailor Brian, Sailor Eric, I think those two were always destined to die. Dr. David Kemp. Alright. And then Ray Lindsay survived. Uh, first Mate Florian Cruz, Navigator, Mike Kroger. I don't think we ever saw Mike Kroger. And then Chef. I feel like those four are unkillable. Unless we were to swap out Florian for Frank. But then I feel like Frank would just play the same role that Florian plays. But I'm going to go and try and see how many of them I can get killed, so I'll be back. Skip, 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 skip. All right, so we're gonna bring Florian this time. At the same moment, Cruz raises her shotgun and fires at something John cannot see. John hears a tiger cry out and whimper. A tense moment passes before she speaks. Oh shoot, she actually shot it. John, I'm right behind you, Florian. What just happened? I shot the dang thing and it ran away. It took around a buckshot like a champ. I can't believe I even had time to shoot him. Or her, I don't know. Anyways, that scratch one tiger, maybe. There's nothing in here, we need to get back to the helm. Oh, so this time Florian actually comes with us because the captain's alive. Okay. Ah, uh, so this time Cruz leads the way and is attacked. So she dies no matter what. Or sorry, she dies instead of uh, Lindsay getting wounded. Val decides to hang on the railing. He's going to die. Upper deck. Oh, I just got an achievement. Maximum death. Okay, so what happened was... Okay. Okay, cool, cool, cool. So I got Val killed by hanging off the edge. I got Florian killed by making her survive, make, or getting her to survive 
instead of um, Frank getting killed. And then Brian and Eric are just bound to die. Those two unfortunate souls. Ray Lindsay gets killed because oh, we failed to shoot. Okay. And then Jean dies too. Hold up. How does she die? Okay, because the two, they're both still alive right here. Cruz dies. Yep. And then a bunch of cubs. A bunch of cubs. Wait, wait hold on. Hold oh, shoot. This is different. This is different. The Scotch Soak site. The tigers have barely touched them. Perhaps they were saving them for a different occasion. They stand and behold the sickening sight. Hold on. You know what this means, right? A bunch of cubs about their mother. These are interrupted by guttural sound. Oh, crap. So, uh, she spins around. And we're going to miss. And what happens? Knocks her to the ground. Last thing she hears is Lindsay's screaming. Oh, so they both just die right there at the same time. Okay. Huh. So the captain doesn't die. Okay. Ah. So this is... I got the achievement for maximum death, too, which is where you get as many people killed as possible. So Mike and Chef are always going to survive. Frank can die, but he just gets replaced by Flor Florian, so it's kind of balance each other out-ish. But Florian, you need to maximize the amount of kills. Okay, got it. Well... Yes, this was the King of Cats, where an, a rich man with money decided to transport tigers to Mexico because he wanted to start something cool. And then the cats got away. And then innocents got killed. So if you're a rich person out there who has a lot of money... Oh my gosh, I just saw this. Look at this. a tiger design. If you're a rich person with a lot of money, do not transport tigers. That is the moral lesson to be learned from this. And that I'm not good at making that many voices. So that's another lesson to be learned today. <laughs> Anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed. Thank you so much for watching. And have a great rest of your day, and your night, and your morning, and your evening, and or midnight. Bye bye. Hey, John, subscribe. Come in. You don't hey, have to. Over. Well, you should. Hey. Yeah. No reply. Ah.